Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 26th of November 2023. It's a grey Sunday morning, I'd normally be at rugby practice with one of my 13 year old twin boys, uh, but he's a little bit ill today so I've taken the opportunity to leave him in bed and uh, do a couple of videos because that's how I roll. Uh, we'll go to where we normally start. Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveat supply. And I do, do, do get hit on a daily basis with a why don't you produce Russian statistics, usually from kind of Russian trolls. I think it would be fairly obvious by now that the Russian stats are woefully inadequate to uh, communicate to you. They are insanely uh, fantastical giving numbers of aircraft shot down that don't even exist, like double the number of aircraft that Ukraine started the war with. So, you know, it's we, that's why, and I've told you a hundred times why I don't give you the Russian figures, but I do give you the Russian uh, Ukrainian general staff figures. And th though there might be an element of propaganda in there, I don't think it works in the Ukrainian's best interest because the Ukrainian figures are for the international audience and the Russian figures are for the dom domestic audience. Once you understand that, you understand why there's a difference in um, credibility with those figures. Now, I also go to some pains to give you evidence to justify these figures. And even if you were to knock 30% off, which I often say, almost every day I say that at the moment, these figures would still be really, really uh, problematic for the Russians. They are indicative, so you don't have to concentrate on the top line figures. Uh, but they tell a story and they give you a trend. All the caveats are in the description to this video below, but I just thought I'd reiterate some of those to you. Now, 1,070 personnel lost yesterday is a huge number. If this was six months ago, that would be like a record day or, or up there amongst the record days. Uh, but now we've seen 1,300 in a single day over the last few weeks. So, you know, things are definitely troublesome for the Russians. That's not to say it isn't costly for the Ukrainians as well at the moment. 11 tanks, 16 APVs and 23 artillery systems. Those are fairly high numbers. Of course, we have been, uh, we have been party to or, or we have seen incredibly high numbers in all those categories over the last few weeks so 11 tanks and 16 apvs might not seem as uh, seem particularly high but that is still 11 tanks to lose in a day is a problem 16 apvs 23 artillery systems definitely a a challenge and two multiple launch rocket systems one anti-aircraft warfare system then we go on to 93 drones that will be the 75 cent in that nightly attack, but then once throughout the day, and also you have a cutoff point where the general staff will stop taking the figures in, and anything that comes just after that in that same night time will, will not be counted. Uh, but uh, that won't really refer to last night unless some of those were early from last night. So there's a whole, whole bunch of reasons why that doesn't look like the number 75. Uh, 29 vehicles and fuel tanks, that's a high loss, a uh, big problem for Russian logistics and one piece of special equipment. So I think uh, useful numbers for the Ukrainians, they are still degrading the Russian capacity and indeed the capabilities, you know, when you're talking about electronic warfare in certain areas, air defense in certain areas, artillery in others, they are not capable of doing counter-battery fire, for example, in ways that, that many of their soldiers would like, as we hear very often from Russian sources. Right, going to Andrew Perpetua's counting up. He's the map I refer to a lot. Please check out yesterday's live stream where Andrew goes through with a fine-tooth comb the entire front line. Always good to have him on. He's such a front of uh, knowledge. But uh, anyway, this is his list. He actually said he admitted he gave up because he was too tired last night. So this is an incomplete list. Um, and that's probably because he spent two hours speaking on, on my live stream yesterday. So sorry, Andrew. Nonetheless, a useful list, even if it's incomplete, we can see that the ratio is firmly in favor of the Ukrainians. We have one Ukrainian. It starts at number four. So that's a ratio of about 25 to one. That's the kind of ratio that, that Russia, uh, that Ukraine r would really want. Um, uh, if they could have that every day, they'd be laughing. Uh, so what do we have here? We have one uh, surveillance comm system, uh, Barrier T, I'm not sure of that. We have a few bits of artillery. 
system, APCs, a tank, uh, IFVs, usual kind of stuff, trucks and civilian vehicles. And for the Ukrainians, a, an M113, an old APC there. So not the highest value kit for the Russians, likewise for the Ukrainian one piece there, but still that's going to smart and that feeds into these kind of figures as well we can get a get a pretty good idea like i've told you before you're not going to see you'll never see a one-to-one -one, uh evidence to claim ratio but i think we can certainly have some confidence that these figures are going in the right direction there okay moving on this is uh, interesting from spartan news they tab me in on this one uh, Ukraine's failed summer offensive. So recently there have been many keyboard commanders who have stated that Ukraine's summer offensive was a failure. I decided to summarize this Scarecrow's failure for them. PS keep failing Ukraine. This is an attempt to calculate the costs of the summer offensive to the Russian army in terms of equipment lost rather like we see there. So I'm, I'm pretty sure they've taken the Ukrainian general staff figures and then put a monetary value to them. Uh, not quite sure how you would uh, evaluate the Russian estimated cost for the Russian men, personnel. 11 aircraft, $549 million. Helicopters, 26, $390 million. Vehicles, 3,925. Uh, $1,436,260,000. Uh, tanks, $4 billion worth of tanks, so on and so forth. And you get down to you know, Kerch Bridge submarine, $300 million. Uh, Ships, $226, uh, $27 million. So that gives you a total of $39 billion worth of loss. Now, you can call that into question in terms of is it exactly correct? Uh, is that replacement cost? Is that you know value from when it was bought? So on and so forth. In addition, the Ukrainian armed forces have managed to liberate approximately 400 square kilometers of territory across the Dnipro River, forced all Russian air assets to move 150 kilometers away from the front lines, and forced the Black Sea Fleet to abandon the Sevastopol naval base in Crimea. When you see it like that, you realize that there are different metrics to measure success. It's not just about square kilometers, as I've said many times. And this has been an exceptionally costly time for the Russians. There's no doubt about that. The Russians will be smarting after this counteroffensive. Now, what's interesting is I think it starts then uh, giving the Ukrainians a better chance of succeeding in the next counteroffensive. So, as they moved from territorial ambitions to wanting to degrade the Russian uh, defences in other ways, not just taking those kilometres, then they are laying themselves up for future success in in a in another counteroffensive, maybe in spring. So, I am at, at like I've said to you over the last few days. I'm at times kind of like up and down with how I feel about how things are going. When I look at this, I think, yeah, do you know what? The Russians have been really badly affected and the Ukrainians have had some incredible successes. We must not forget the strikes on on the Kerch shipbuilding um, marina and the dry docks in Sevastopol. The loss of, of really valuable na naval assets and the daily numbers that get posted by the general staff. It's just, yeah, the, the Russians will be smarting. And then I think about, well, the reserves the Russians have in terms of the amount of equipment and their continual ability to just throw troops, no matter how quality they are or aren't, at the at the war. And we're going to talk about that in a little while. So moving on, uh, we have a destroyed Russian communication tower on the occupied left bank of the Kherson region near Aleshki Sands. That's a whole big old tower just coming down there, um, falling to the ground. So that's a kind of targeting ukrainians will find very useful they need to really debilitate the russian electronic warfare and uh, isr capabilities so the isr's intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance okay russian sources claim that the enemy along with aerial drones also uses ground drones with explosives the scary thing is that these drones are equipped with thermal sensors and if you get too close to them they say they will explode but this is, uh, yeah, the claim that Ukrainians are using a number of uh, 
of assets to do um to do their activities so interesting right moving on to distance strikes uh right here we have the result of last night's aerial activities into ukraine eight out of nine shahids were shot down so that is a good interception rate but also not nearly as many as the night before where you had sort of 75 drones uh, sent at ukraine and it could be that these many of these are added on to the figures that i showed you this morning uh so you had two nights worth of figures okay it's notable that per ltg naive 53 percent so that's around 40 of the 75 shahids sent that's two nights ago that big wave of shahids 53% of them were destroyed by mobile air defense groups armed with heavy machine guns, anti-aircraft guns, and man pads, man portable air defense systems like the Stingers. While we don't have a breakdown of man pads versus mostly optically directed HMG and AAGs, it's a reminder that cheap threats have cheap counters. This has been something that a lot of analysts have talked about since the, since the beginning of the war, well, since Russia started using these Shahid drones. And it's like, right, it's too expensive to use really a high value air defense systems against these you know if you're using nazams um and you know samp t and patriot missiles against these low value you know low cost low tech drones then you're going to find yourself spending an awful lot of money and russia will degrade the ukrainian air defense systems not by blowing it up uh, but by just getting the ukrainians to use all their expensive missiles up and then after a while they can the russians will be able to get through because they don't have those missiles left it's just too expensive it's just costing the ukrainians and their allies too much so there needs to be a low-cost solution to the low-cost problem and that is things like gepards so that's why gepards became so valuable these old supposedly obsolete um, you know, auto cannons firing lead into the air suddenly became in high in demand. So they've been brought on board and they've got a whole bunch of more of them from Jordan recently and also just whacking heavy machine guns on the back of uh, L500 SUVs. We've seen a bunch of those Mitsubishis. Uh, given some from some I don't know where they've got them from acquired them but anyway they have found their way uh, into Ukrainian use they've got all sorts of different old school um, anti-aircraft guns that that have been sort of not repurposed but, but dusted off and are being reused and to, to see them take out over half of the drones going into Kiev is fantastic and long may that continue and hopefully that percentage will go up the more they can take out with cheap lead uh, effectively you know comparatively speaking the better it is for Ukraine and they can save those those missiles for the uh, for the cruise missiles and the kinjars that will no doubt be following along soon they uh, I was talking to Andrew Perpetua on the live stream about this last night about how they should be the Ukrainians should be able to get heaps of people to do this work I mean I Andrew said something I've thought about previously which is like if I was going to sign up like just from a purely selfish I want to live kind of approach if I was going to sign up to to fight in a war I'd be like oh you know I've got MS but I say uh, it, you don't want me in the trenches I'll happily sit behind um, a heavy machine gun firing lead into the sky and you can train me all you like and I'll, I'll you know once I get the experience I'll, hopefully I'll be able to contribute effectively and you know you can be fairly infirm you can be uh, and no disrespect but you know there's no issues to gender uh, and actually age so you could be a like a, a, a 60 year old woman and be able to operate one of these guns or at least drive the vehicle do, do you know what i mean like the the so the point being you can easily man these teams there's enough it's not like mobilizing people for front line where people aren't up for that you should be able to man loads of these air defense teams and they are relatively cheap a heavy machine gun on the back of a of an suv job done this isn't this isn't acquiring like a nazam's launcher from another country so Getting a whole bunch of these teams around major cities must surely be at the top of the agenda for the Ukrainians. 
Right, and, and in fact, we are seeing, as this uh, source says, with the increase in attacks by Russian military munitions on Ukrainian cities, Ukraine is increasing the number of mobile air defense teams. And uh, this is, in this source, um, military, military uh, is, which is a Ukrainian website. With increasing attacks, uh, they are getting more of these mobile teams. It's hoped that the air defense teams will be capable of confronting Russia's terrorist tactics. Let's remember how it started, and then it sort of goes through uh, how it started. And then initial solutions, and you, you get all of these, like Tor, Book, S-125, uh, S-300, Iris T, Nazans, Patriot, Sam T, Hawk, and others. But of course, you know, with scarce missiles, it's not ideal. Uh, and so the Gepards came along, and we started seeing Avengers also brought in, which are man pads on the back of, these are stingers, but sort of pods of uh, four each. So I think you've got eight stingers on the back of there. Uh, so again, that that's obviously... Uh, higher tech and higher value than than a heavy machine gun on the back of an L500 but it's it's not quite your Nazams or your Patriots uh, so uh, so on and so forth so you know you get all of these different um options and then here this is this is where we're starting to see more of these kind of SUVs with machine guns or SUVs Humvee there with a with a I don't know if that's a star streak or a, some some other kind of system on the back of that um and then just you know Teams here, here are quad teams that are getting on a quad by the looks of it and shooting uh, their small arms fire into the air can even help. Um, so yeah, l loads of loads of uh, great info in this. I, I don't have time to go through it now. Um, it's it's about as well um, being able to spot them, having good uh, thermal optics that that can differentiate the uh, the sky. Uh, from the Shahid, different thermal um, signatures and whatnot, searchlights, everything like that. So uh, I might I might have a look at that in an extra. I keep saying that and not doing extras because I just run out of time. Uh, anyway, moving on, Defense Ministry of the Russian Federation reported on a repeated morning attack by drones across Russia. Allegedly, four aircraft were shot down over the territory of Bryansk, Smolensk and the Tula regions. Earlier, social networks reported about the flight of an unmanned aerial vehicle and new explosions in the Russian Tula. Fact, you well, if we go, we'll come to that in a second. Actually, what Tula? Russia reports mass drone strikes in Moscow region. Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanin and Russia's Ministry of Defense assert the successful interception of 21 drones en route to Moscow, neutralizing them in various regions with no casualties or damage. This is a very common claim by the Russians. They claim almost always that there is no damage. Or casualties and then you later find out there's huge damage like bases have been blown up so uh, again you know just the russians are not to be believed whether we will find out many details of of what these drones have done i don't know i'm sure many of them will have been shot down and also electronic warfare in particularly moscow is 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 very good so indeed you can sit, have a look at this bit of footage I think this is in Tula. You can see a drone has hit a residential building. Now, you can bet your bottom dollar that Ukraine will not... They're not going to send a drone across Russia to then fly into the side of a residential building to cause virtually no strategic damage. You, you know, that is not useful for them. It's not a good use of drones. So that's almost certainly electronic warfare, sending a drone... Uh, somewhere else uh, there is you know lots of evidence of drones doing stuff so some big explosions you can't tell whether that is an explosion hitting a city or why that one's interesting is because that didn't look like any air defense uh, at most that's electronic warfare bringing one down but there's no evidence that that drone was was aimed at shot at or anything so when they talk about you know they were all brought down I mean straight away that's looking unlikely and the big explosion resulting there when you look at uh this building that's the same one we just looked at but in the daytime you you can again it's like yeah they didn't send a drone across across russia to do that so that won't have been intentional 
And then you've got, you know, more evidence here. As as we just heard, we heard that one. Here is another example, though you can't hear that one. The quiet, um, a silent CCTV. But there's a massive explosion in the background. Whether that was brought down or not, I don't know. After the Russian Shahid attack yesterday night, Ukraine responded with a drone attack on Russian cities in Moscow. Five drones were reportedly shot down while 20 drones struck other places. In Tula, a high-rise building was hit and in some Sm Smolensk explosions were also recorded. Now, Smolensk is the, is the interesting one. If we go back to um, P-Star 1 here. So, if looking at the Sm Smolensk uh, issue, there was... Uh, a, it was hit. It's here. It is new explosions report in Tula. Russians report about drone hit in Smolensk in the area of an aircraft factory. The information still needs to be clarified. The factory was also attacked a few weeks ago by uh, Ukrainian drones. So that is almost certainly what the target was there. According to one version, Ukraine armed forces attacked Tula with drones made like a flying wing, which is why they are similar to the famous Russian geranium. Those are the Shahids. Experts are currently figuring out what, what kind of device this is. So far, it's known that it has nothing to do with the UJ-22 and the Beavers. So this is a new drone, um, which is itself interesting and uh, supposedly is fairly maneuverable, I think, um, where, which I've seen somewhere. Um, I can't remember. So many sources I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, anyway, we'll we'll wait to see what the uh, outcome of those drone attacks were. It, it, they might have have had some great effect, or they might indeed have been shot down or brought down with electronic warfare. Um, okay. Meanwhile, uh, Donetsk occupied. Donetsk has seen a big explosion there. Not quite sure what um, or how. Uh, but nonetheless, Ukrainians are active within the Russian-occupied territories. Explosions are heard in temporarily occupied Sevastopol as well, according to local uh, residents. An air alert has been declared in the city in the city due to the missile threat. We are waiting for official confirmation. Uh, and then Russians find out that attacking the critical infrastructure is a game that can be played by two, as half of temporary occupied Donetsk is apparently without electricity after successful. Ukrainian strike takes out a distribution center. Uh, and here the, the claim is half of Donetsk is without power. After night shelling, I woke up from the cold. The boiler turned off. It's good that there is a modern and uh, that there is a modem and the laptop is charged. But that's half the problem. The high miles arrived. Presumably the JCCC had not arrived yet to the car service center where I was getting repairs before the start of the war. And of course, after where the gold real golden hands of Donbass work. I really appreciate their friendship and attitude. The repair area has been damaged, but the men are already figuring out how and when to begin to repair and restore. There was no fire, and that's good. Someone talking uh, as well in the Russian sources, in the Russian information space. Uh, it was a really interesting um, rant about this, you know, this residential building that was hit in Tula, saying. Where's Biden giving us patriots to defend ourselves against the Ukrainian? It's like, dude, have you seen what you've done to Mariupol? Have you seen what you've done to Kiev, particularly before they got air defences? Have you seen what you've done to Kherson? Have you seen what you've done to Dnipro Petrovsk and Zaporizhia? Gee whiz. Demanding that it's unfair that, that a residential building has been hit by a, a no doubt... Um, you know, errant drone, uh, and it's done negligible damage. It's like, come on, sort it out. Uh, anyway, uh, there you go. Uh, so lots of activity in the air overnight um, from from particularly the Ukrainians. I haven't seen what has happened as a result of the Russian strikes. I mean, eight out of nine, I don't know where the one hit that got through, and I don't know what the damage the eight did either. There's, there's no information about that. So there, there might be some issues for the Ukrainians there, but it looks like it was a larger attack by the Ukrainians, but certainly nothing like the 75 that the Russians sent the night before. Right. The Crimean bridge is doomed. Uh, we're on to other bits and pieces now. There will be many surprises further on, says the head of security service of Ukraine, Vazil Maliuk. Uh, th quote, this is quite a legitimate target for us. According to the norms of the Geneva Convention, other international law, the current legislation of Ukraine, customs and the traditions of warfare, this is quite a legitimate target. Right. What's really interesting about this is when you, are, when you get this 
kind of messaging from the Ukrainians. See how important it is that what they strike is within the norms, uh, within the uh, the remit of international, sort of legal international war uh, and war rules and regulations. When Russia do stuff, they give a damn. And they're certainly not communicating it. You hear these, you know, what? A funeral was hit and 59 people are, are killed. And they're like, yeah, eh, tumbleweed. And here they're saying, well, Kerch is a legitimate target. And we know this, and it's really important that, that we set out that it's well within the remit of, of your, well within the regulations of international law. So we're going to hit it at some point, just to let you know. This bridge is an illegal structure on the territory of Ukraine, Maliuk said in the documentary SSU, uh, Special Operations of Victory. By the way, I'm halfway through brilliant Bylines TV documentary uh, called... Um, un well, it's got several names actually. Uh, I think the official one now is un under. Uh, in fact, I'm going to find it. So this is it. It's um, it's produced and presented by John Sweeney, who is a famous BBC documentarian or is a journalist, investigative journalist. You might know him if you if you from the UK. You might know him from the famous Scientology documentary he did, where he was he was hunted, but he was followed by Scientologists for like days and days and days. You know, in the way they do and filming him, and he lost the plot and shouted at them on on, on the camera, screamed at them. It was a really famous uh, like bit of British TV. Anyway, John Sweeney is awesome. His Killer in a Kremlin book is 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 a must read um, about Putin. And this documentary is fantastic. So I've, I, I've, um, you can see it on Amazon Prime. You can see it on uh, through YouTube if you pay. Uh, but I've gone to Bylines TV because they're a great um, media organisation who who have made it, and I'd rather pay them than those other two. Um, but anyway, fun fact: I should be interviewing John Sweeney. Uh, so he's he's I've I've contacted him. Um, it might be quite difficult, he's a, he's a busy man, but hopefully we'll be interviewing John Sweeney soon. So that's fantastic because he is such high value. Um, anyway, uh, just I thought I'd throw that one in there. Where was I? Right. Back to this. So the documentary SSU Special Operations of Victory. He added that the Ukrainians are experts on the Crimean Bridge. After the first attack, the Russians were unable to fully restore the bridge's functionality for eight months. OK, so interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll watch out for that one. And I've said before... There is a reason it hasn't been struck. You know, otherwise, I'm fairly sure they would have continued striking it or doing stuff. Uh, so the, I, my opinion is that they are waiting for the right moment. It, it is, of, is of use to them not striking it now, I would have thought. But they could also be just waiting to get the right capability to be able to do that because the Russians will be so tight on stopping any kind of attack happening again to the, to the Kerch Bridge. Russian government extended the age limit. So this is going back. This is uh, talking about a number of thing, things. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've linked a few things together. Okay, sorry, I confused myself. So the Russian government has extended the age limit for conscription to 30, effective from January, 23rd, uh, January 1st, 2024. These changes were approved on Friday, November the 24th, as a result of the adoption of the relevant re legislation by the Russian parliament, Interfax News Agency reported. Now men aged 18 to 30, that's instead of the previously, previous maximum age of 27, can be enlisted. Expert Igor Efremov, a researcher of the Gaidar Institute for Economic Policy, estimates that taking into account the new age limits, approximately 2 million more men will be drafted into the army in 2024. That seems an awful lot. 9.14 million men instead of the previous 6.8 million. I mean, the accuracy of those figures aside, uh, that is a, a useful way of... The Russians getting boots on the ground without doing a full mobilization. It's a, they're kind of their crypto mobilization. They we've seen them do this, change the age limits both ways on different um, aspects of conscription and mobilization, so on and so forth. This is uh, the the annual conscription. Now you can be up to thirty. So say you've been at university or and you've got exemptions here and there, or you just missed like the random call i don't know how they do it but you just miss the the lot and if you got to 27 it means yeah i won't be conscripted now actually you've now got three more years 
of being able to be conscripted. So the chances are you are going to be conscripted or the chances are much higher. So that means that, that I guess more people can be conscripted and they can, they can raise the numbers as well in, in line with raising the age limit. Now, uh, again, in light of this kind of need for boots on the ground, because the Russian army, well, because of the war, right, we've had Russian men be signed up and go to the front line, both volunteers, mobilized. We've got, had convicts going to the front line. We've had Russian men running away from Russia and escaping to other countries to avoid mobilization, to avoid conscription, so on and so forth. We know that there is a labor shortage as a result of those things going on in Russia. Now, under wartime pressure, Russian Railways is reportedly planning to conscript convicts to carry out heavy labor on the railway. Russia also faces a shortage of railway freight cars as the manufacturers have been diverted into making tanks and troop carrying wagons. So one of the uh, carriage manufacturers is also uh, one of the major military equipment manufacturers. And that is absolutely true. It's, it's having to make military equipment and not railway um, railway stocks. So a leaked telegram, telegram issued by Russian Railways with, and published by VCHK OGPU Telegram Channel instructs regional bodies to work with the Federal Penitentiary Service of Russia to attract, quote, contingents of convicts who work on a railway, likely in the next few weeks. This is due to an acute short, shortage of personnel with the state-owned operator, which the state-owned operator attributes, attributes to the practical impossibility of recruiting men aged 30 to 39. The war economy and likely competition from military recruitment has made it hard to find new employees. Russian Railways reportedly does not want to raise salaries with a workforce of over 740,000. This would almost certainly cost too much. So you can't use... You know, supply and demand, you, you can't use market forces to try and attract people in, in a labor shortage because unfortunately to do that would cost the state too much because Russia is a, is a railway state. It's a huge country and so therefore transporting stuff up and down the country or side to side is done predominantly by railway. It's unlike, say, the UK, where railway freight is less significant because we're a relatively geographically small country. So the road haulage uh, picks up a lot of the slack from, from where railways and, and once canals did a lot, a lot of the work. In Russia, that's not practical. Uh, they are railway army as well uh, for the same reason. So raising the, the having they, they have you know, a huge workforce working on the railways. And to just say, right, we'll attract more people by offering higher salaries. That sounds great to, to the free market economists, but in, in this case would cost the state just way too much money. Uh, and they already are spending over 30% of their budget on the war. So they turn instead to sending recruiters into Russia's prison colonies and uh, be used to maintain the tracks and train. So th this is another example of how desperate Russia is and how things are, are difficult behind the scenes in so many different contexts. Um, now, Anton Gerashchenko says in a completely different uh, for a completely different topic, about 500 pilots from around the world have joined the initiative to deliver humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Among them are professional pilots, retired pilots from major airlines, and even former pilots and fighter and helicopter pilots. Quote, they are not paid, they are all volunteers, says Kai Wolf, a representative of Ukraine Air Rescue. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. It's heartwarming to know, says Gerashchenko, how many amazing people there are in the world. So here we have sort of volunteers who have got flight experience or pilot experience um, working to aid Ukraine to get um, aid across the, the country, uh, humanitarian aid to different places. So fantastic. Um, and it, again, you know, I, I said yesterday because it's so obviously true that this is a, a war between the good guys and the bad guys, right? And it's so obviously that case. And so, a few trolls had a go at me for being, oh, it's, oh really? There's good guys, bad guys. How simplistic, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, no, it really is that simple. It really is that simple. Go and look at any other conflict and you'll be like, oh, who are the good guys? Like Hamas, Israel. Like, oh my goodness, that's a complex one. This one is like, Ukraine were doing just fine, then they were invaded by the Russians, and then the Russians attacked loads of cities, and then they've killed, you know, hundreds of thousands 
of people, including a, a shed load of civilians and children. And they've stolen, deported children out of Ukraine into Russia. And there is now over 110,000 logged war crimes. Like, yes, I'm pretty certain who the good guys and the bad guys are in this conflict. Thank you very much. And one indicator is how many volunteers are going to help Ukraine. How many international like humanitarian aid workers and, and volunteers are going to Ukraine out of the goodness of their heart because they know what is right and what is wrong, right? And here's another example of that. People proudly having pictures taking them doing all the work they have done, right? And then you, and then you look at Russia and you're thinking, uh, where are all your volunteers from around the world working for the humanitarian cause of furthering the Russian uh, war project? Oh, no, you don't really have them because, because you are the bad guys. Just another example. And then, you know, th there's been this, um, there was a, a problematic piece released saying, was it the New York Times? can't remember. Uh, Tatarigami's done a whole analysis of this, wasn't happy, because the, the piece was like, X many more civilians have been killed by, by Israel, uh, is, is the implication, in the Gaza, in, in the Israel-Hamas conflict, than civilians have died in like two years of war in Ukraine, as if it's like some kind of competition, as if you want to make a, make a point that what's going on in Israel is worse than Ukraine. So it was really, yeah, not, not too sure about that as, as a rationale for writing an article. But there's also people like Tatragami, as I said, taking aim at some of the claims in that article because actually there are statistics of civilian deaths that are out there that are woefully undercounted because people just don't know what's happened in Mariupol, for example. Uh, people just don't know what's happened in other places up and down the front line. So Mariupol, they're, they're now, this is interesting that this has come out like a, a day after that article saying 7,000 graves of innocent civilians killed in Mariupol by Putin. You, you just, there are potentially huge numbers of, of dead civilians from Mariupol that just haven't been uh, accounted for anyway uh yeah again who the good guys who the bad guys i think it's fairly uh obvious thank you for watching i'm just gonna i said like you know proud dad and all that my, my boys got into the portsmouth evening news so that that's good there he is he's the one painted green uh, he had that uh ice skating thing to open the pop-up ice rink uh so it's really cool to um to, to see him i mean my partner did a fab job on making him green and he still is broadly quite green even after several uh baths and showers although i wouldn't want to i don't know why he decided to have a bath it's like a pea soup um anyway uh yeah that's pretty cool i'm pretty happy with that he, he did a good job uh and um very furry and now he keeps wanting to wear green hair wax uh, because he thinks it looks cool um, so there you go. I, I look forward to seeing what schools say on Monday when I'm sure he's going to argue that he's, he's entitled to go in with hair looking like that. Um, the light of having a boy on the spectrum. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for your support. Really appreciate your viewership. Take care and I'll speak to you soon.